70, 50, 70, 70, 400 pounds, 400 pounds, 450, 450, 450, 450 now, 450, 500 pounds, 500 pounds, 500 pounds, 550, 550, 550, 600 pounds, 600 pounds, 650, 650, 650, 700 pounds, 700 pounds, 700 pounds, 700 pounds, 720, 720, 720, ah, he's got up to 20 pounds, 720 pounds, all finished now at 720 pounds selling. I think basically people want to have pictures on their wall which give them a little bit of a lift and we certainly find that, particularly with Paul Henry, Paul Henry's uh, quality, the quality of, of, of his paintings is um, unsurpassed, I believe, in, in Irish landscape painting of the 20th century in any event. But I still know that there's a lot of people out there who can't stand Paul Henry's work. Purchased by him in the 1920s, as I understand. So, Paul Henry's Village by the Lake, lot number 40. May I start, please, at £15,000 for this painting? It's a very fine example. Paul Henry's paintings have been increasing in value quite dramatically in the last number of years. £16,000 and five, sixteen five, sixteen five. £17,000 now, £17,500. What I admire most about Henry as a painter is what I admire in any artist whom I consider to be a, a really interesting painter, is, is that he found a way of seeing that was peculiar to himself and offered something new to the viewer. £25,000, all finished and selling at £25,000. Going... Paul Henry star I think is now in the ascendancy. He's certainly regarded as one of the major Irish painters of the 20th century. Paul Henry has been described as the father of Irish landscape painting and the images he produced have long been associated with the new Irish state. He had a love affair with the west of Ireland which dates from 1910 when he spent time there on Arkell Island. He has been criticised almost as a chocolate box painter, but I think his work deserves a reassessment. Born in Belfast in 1876, he was the son of a Baptist minister. He studied art in Belfast before going to Paris as a student. While there, he met his future wife, the painter Grace Henry. It was the turn of the century, and Paris was the capital of the art world. It was a sort of bohemian Paris that we probably now all, all think about. Uh, so it was a gay, lively, evocative place to be. In artistic terms, he would have been influenced by oh, late Impressionism, Van Gogh, Gauguin. There's one stage in his autobiography, An Irish Portrait, he said that after a little while in Paris, he would have walked halfway across the city to see a Van Gogh. So clearly Van Gogh in particular made a very big impression upon him. He left Paris in uh, late 1899 and went to London to earn his living. He trained as a painter in Paris, but uh, he clearly wasn't going to get that sort of work in London. So after a little bit of time, he began to do illustrative work. Paul eventually did a lot of theatrical work and he was sent along to theatres to record the first night of this or the first night of that. And I think the sort of theatrical studies he made, the sense of drama in terms of uh, harsh contrast of light and dark and so on uh, in these drawings for newspapers. I think that was something which later he worked into his, to his paintings. But it was as an illustrator that he carved a not inconsiderable niche for himself in London, where he spent in fact 10 years and all. No artist truly finds himself until a number of things conspire in his favour. And in my opinion, uh, Henry found himself truly when he went to the west of Ireland. What attracted me most of all was the wild beauty of the landscape, of the colour and variety of the cloud formations, one of the especial glories of the west of Ireland. As I sat on the rocky point of Gobelinon with nothing between me and America, 
with a turbulent sea 30 feet below me foaming upon the rocks, I mused upon my position. The currents of life had carried me to this remote spot, and there seemed no current strong enough to carry me away. I made another of my quick decisions, which I never regretted, and taking my return ticket to London out of my pocket, tore it into small pieces and scattered the fragments into the sea which foamed round the rocks below me. The desire to live in Achel was a purely emotional one. I wanted to live there, not as a visitor, but to identify myself with its life and to see it every day in all its moods, in wind, in rain, in storm, in summer and winter, and by painting it in all these conditions to find out, if I could, the driving force behind its attractiveness. He moved about a bit between Achill and Dublin and coming home to visit his, his, uh, his mother in Belfast. But Achill was his base from 19 to 19, and he was completely enthralled and captivated by the island. Achill spoke to me. It called to me as no other place had ever done. I had never lived among mountains, and the abruptness of its contours and their size disturbed me as a plain dweller. The landscape was vast and seemed to demand a huge canvas, a sort of panorama. I walked prodigious distances because I liked walking. I was able to sit down whenever I wanted to and make drawings on the way, taking any opportunities to get off the beaten track. Wherever I went, I saw things to draw. I was restless with excitement and never tired. movement of colour on the water, the action of a woman as she spread the seaweed over her tiny field, the changing colour of the sky. All this life provided me with inspiration for my work. I had always been attracted by the old people, the old age pensioners of the island. They represented a dying generation with a sturdiness of character and a dignity of manner, which I noticed to my sorrow was passing. I had seen the first furrow being cut by the first plough that ever turned over the soil of Kiel. I was witnessing, with sorrow, the gradual discarding of the scarlet petticoat by the women folk. I felt that I was watching the end of an epoch the slow fading out of an era. I think Paul Henry brought, for the first time, what one might properly term a realist approach to painting the landscape. 
realist in a, a sense of a high degree of naturalism. If one looks at much of what had happened in late 19th century Arias painting, you have uh, an unabashed romanticism, a romantic view, especially of the West, with people dancing at the crossroads. Uh, but if you look closely, very often the children in these paintings are dancing with barefoot and so on. So the reality of their lives wasn't quite what the romance of the scene might have suggested. You get a lot of images of stage Irishmen doing humorous poses and so on. But Henry broke with all that. When Henry paints potato diggers or people working in the fields or people leading a donkey across a, a rugged landscape, one is aware of the fact that life is hard for these people, that they were working hard for relatively little return, that they were going home in the evening not to smart houses but to, to hovels in effect. So life was hard and harsh. When he came to study the people themselves, as we see in that remarkable picture of the potato harvest, for instance, uh, he captured this quality of the old man digging the potatoes. The texture of the clothes, the quality of the paint laid on, which makes you feel you're actually looking at the tweeds, at the wool, at the colour. And so one gets drawn into this, and gradually as you look at this old potato digger, you're drawn down into the ground, and you can feel the potatoes coming up out of it, and of the food which the people will get, indicated by the lady with her backpack waiting to pick up her potatoes so that she can bring them home. And that gives you a, a close connection between the reality of life and the dream quality of the landscape. As my knowledge of Achel grew, I could not help feeling the greatest admiration for the women. They not only did all the work of the house, quite a job in itself, but worked in the harvest fields as well. Cooking, washing, weeding the potatoes, they had no time for anything but work, and they never complained. They always had a cheery word, and as I heard them laughing as they worked, it struck me that laughter can sometimes be a very terrible thing, because they were old long before their time. His sketchbooks uh, and sketching formed the basis of his whole approach to picture making. You can look, for example, at the little, almost thumbnail sketches he would make in his sketchbooks of virtually th what became Finnish landscapes. The masses, the relationship of mountains uh, in the background uh, to perhaps a habitation or something in the foreground, the relationship of uh, sky to earth, the relative proportions of one area to another. All these things he would work out very concisely, very spontaneously, but with great deliberation. From my experience of Paul Henry's sketches, they seem to have been very lightning-like, very fast, really to do with notations of movement. They are also covered with notes, with writing, and I love to see that because that lets you into the mind of the painter and how he thought about colour. His method of working is, is a method of progression towards the final image. The mood and atmosphere of the landscape uh, he often made studies on. We find in his sketchbooks many studying say of clouds and here there's notations for colour, there's notations in his own little code which he would understand as to how light or how dark different parts of a cloud might be. You think of Henry's cloud, his great columns of cloud, almost like classical columns. Forget for a moment the rich impasto of them, 
the way the paint's put on so that you feel the billow of the cloud. That's lovely, but don't think about that for the moment. Uh, think more of the structure and emphasis of the cloud leading you up and great, giving you this great monumental balance. But then, as against that, because of the, if you like, the impasto, the, the paint, the clouds are, for want of a better term, they're sort of full bosomed, you know? Another aspect of the realism which Henry brought to the landscape is his treatment of the landscape itself. Uh, if one compares earlier painters of the Irish scene, uh, people like James Arthur O'Connor perhaps in the early 19th century, you have a rather idealised Claudian romantic view of a landscape. It is Ireland, it doesn't look like Ireland, it could be England, it could be Italy for that matter. But with Henry, I think, and his new realism, when he paints the West of Ireland, it could only be the West of Ireland. It couldn't be anywhere else. He has captured the atmosphere very much, with just perhaps a little bit of white paint on the top of water, on top of blue. You can almost hear the rustle of water. They're amazing um, landscapes for me, and I think as a layperson, you, we can just enjoy the paintings, and we're not looking for deep meaning in them. He painted a landscape, and you can enjoy it for what it is, a very beautiful painting. He had an extreme ability and dexterity with charcoal. And for a long time, uh, charcoal was one of his main uh, means of picture making. He talks himself in his, uh, his eyes portrait uh, about the qualities of charcoal, which had a, a softness and in the right hand, uh, wonderful dexterity and the softness and the gentleness. And I think the sort of closely modulated tones, again, which we see in his paintings, came across very well in charcoal, and possibly charcoal, too, influenced his, his, uh, his way of picture making in, in oils. It's a very versatile medium. Like all graphic mediums, it has got its own characteristics of expression. It can be used as broad washes of tone. It can be scraped through to give texture. It has an infinite variety of depth, from deep, rich, velvety black up to pearly, pale grey. And Paul Henry used these qualities and textures to evoke his vision of the landscape, lifting it from the sketch and extending its potential. And you begin to feel the gradual emergence of the painting that's going to come. You can see it being conceived and born within the, uh, the charcoal. He would often be up at uh, the first light of dawn, he tells us in an Irish portrait. In fact, there he says that he often had a good day's work done before me most people were, were, were astir in the morning. But he worked in the early mornings when the light, especially in summertime, would have been predisposed to misty greys and so on. And in the west of Ireland, with the softness of the light, uh, clearly this was another influence on, on his treatment of the landscape and on his handling of colour. So you don't get great differences, great contrasts of light and dark. You get one tone and one form gently evolving into another.
We're nearly all fundamentally romantics, and we want our ideas to float into the picture and float through the theme of the picture. So in this way, Paul Henry, it seems to me, uh, achieved a vision of an early Ireland, which could be hundreds and hundreds of years ago because the people haven't changed their costume, the landscape hasn't changed, the aura of these places remains. And this became a substitute for him, for the kind of Ireland which was, uh, we all have bandied around us even at the present moment, which is less pleasant than what we can just dream about, the romantic view. His work seemed to represent a kind of stability and certainty and security uh, for many people that I think uh, the new state was hoping to uh, solidify. People felt that uh, their, his vision of the West of Ireland reflected something in themselves that the revolution and the War of Independence had been about. It had been an effort to establish uh, what was called in the ideology of the day an Irish Ireland. There was a sense that there was an indigenous, essential place, which was the true Ireland. And this had always been associated, at least since the 1880s, with the west of the country. Somehow that area, the area that was so far from the pale, where English rule had not ever fully established itself, where the Irish language was still spoken, represented that true and indigenous Ireland. And Paul Henry's paintings uh, seemed to express that world in a very powerful and effective way. Much that De Valera's Ireland stood for uh, was romance and was myth. Uh, it never really uh, existed. The Paul Henry landscape looks as if it has permanence, if, as if it has always been there. But of course the reality uh, was quite different because young people, for example, living in the west of Ireland on a Saturday evening were going to the local town village hall or local church hall and they were looking at films from the latest offerings of Hollywood and so on and they were seeing what the world was like elsewhere. So the sort of values which so many people wanted to imbue upon the country in the 20s and 30s were outmoded. The whole concept was doomed uh, from the very beginning. His paintings, especially the later landscapes, became extremely popular, but having financial difficulties, he began to paint to satisfy the growing demand. This more romantic work was widely reproduced as prints and posters. I think the impact of the posters and also on the, um, the prints that were published in the 1930s and 40s and 50s um, had, a, had a, a negative impact on Paul Henry's reputation amongst the general population to such an extent that I think the people in the 60s and 70s really didn't think an awful lot of his work simply because they thought, oh, that's just another Paul Henry. It's another sort of chocolate boxy, idealized view of, of Ireland. He did it so perfectly and he did it so well. And might I suggest or dare to suggest that he did it so often and maybe a wee bit too often eventually that um, what one saw could almost be irreverently described as a perfect recipe that was continually repeated. As we developed as, as a nation, um, we wanted to leave a lot of that behind. And it was only when we matured, I think, as a nation that we could actually even look at the posters and look at the prints um, with a different eye. We're far enough away from Paul Henry now uh, to, to be rather saddened by the fact that he seems to be an artist whom a lot of amateur painters believe can be easily copied and can be easily adapted. He can't be really, but when it's attempted, it's so blatantly obvious and so pathetic, but unfortunately so acceptable that uh, he's had a rather uh, pernicious effect to a degree on the way serious Irish painting could go. 
people remember those posters from the 50s and they're inclined to think that those blue mountains clouds and perhaps a little stream and of course the Irish cottage the thatch cottage with the turf pile beside it they're inclined to think that they're the only thing he painted whereas the reality is his range was very extensive well, lot, uh, number 77 Paul Henry potato harvest a wonderful picture by Paul Henry one of the finest uh, to appear on the market anywhere in a long number of years <clears throat> so who will start me at say 25,000 I bid 25,000 pounds I bid any advance on 25,000 pounds for the potato harvest at 25,000 pounds 26 27 28 29 30,000 at 30,000 pounds any advance on 31 it's interesting that there there is this shift in interest in Paul Henry's figurative works first of all they're very rare they don't turn up very often um, and I think a lot of the interest in his figurative works comes from um, basically a sort of a move away in terms of what people, uh, the sort of pic pictures that people like nowadays towards, towards the sort of the human interest as opposed to just bare landscapes. 44, 46, 48, 50,000, 52, 54, 56, 58, this work has its own memorability. He had the capacity to produce images that in their simplicity and strength go straight into the, into the visual memory. At £60,000, our ladies bid at 60000 Any advance on £60,000 for the Paul Henry? At 60000 62, 64, 66, 68, 70000 he has given us a view of our own landscape which is unique, it couldn't be anywhere else. And because of that he has given us an understanding of the type of people we are, rooted very much to the landscape. Place, with a capital P, in a Paul Henry painting is very important. 96, 98, 100,000. 102,000, 103, 103,000 pounds, 104, at 104,000 pounds, any advance down, 104,000 pounds, any advance, Are you all out, at 104,000, thank you. I did not expect to make much money out of Acho. I doubt if money bothered me much in those days, but I was in a place I wanted to live in as I'd never wanted anything. And if that is not a rosy prospect, I don't know what is. He said, this place has got a great majesty, a great scale, but equally, a stunning simplicity, which is fundamentally incredibly rich if you know how to look for it and if you know how to look at it. I was destined not to see Achel again, except in my dreams, for years. But turning over my sketchbooks, as I very often do, I catch glimpses on their pages of something that will make me less forlorn. Mm -hmm.